Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. <coughs> And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Uh, check out Tee Public for your Christmas shopping. You can get t-shirts, coffee mugs, pillowcases, bags, all kinds of things you probably need and didn't even know about it. I'm not the only guy selling things on the site. Uh, check out all the cool things at teepublic.com. Don't wait till the last minute for your Christmas shopping or you'll wind up having to go to the corner grocery store to buy things for people. I keep hearing new and confusing ways of saying the same thing. I really hate hearing people say a, a, a UAPs. It's the government trying to still say that UFOs don't exist, but these new things are something else. They're trying to convince folks they haven't been lying to us since the 50s. I'll keep calling them UFOs. Those three videos the news keeps showing, the ones the government admit are real and unknown, I think I've seen them enough. We all know the videos are from 2004. That is 17 years ago. The guys who saw them said they were seeing these things all the time. Every day or so, the UFOs would be buzzing around the fleet. Pilots would talk to each other, so as to not lose their flight status, about seeing things in the sky that nobody could explain. The government finally came out and said they were con reconsidering the way pilots could report seeing things without fear of ridicule or losing their flight status. A lot of people I know got excited. They thought the government was going to finally admit UFOs were real. And that's not what the government said. They were going to allow people to file reports, top secret reports, about having an encounter with a UFO. The only good coming from this was now the military people could say they saw something. Once the report was made, I'll bet the witness was sworn to never say anything about it. As for those three videos we keep seeing over and over... They're great, but what else does the government have on film that we never see? Alien Hunter Daryl Sims asked, What else does the government have that they're not showing us? In 17 years, I'll bet they got a lot of other UFOs on tape. They only show us the things we've already seen or we already know about. Uh, someday soon, the folks in Washington will roll out a brand new agency where we can all report our own UFO encounters. It will be your typical government bureaucracy run by folks who don't really care, who will take your report and send it off to some filing cabinet, like File 13, and then some guy in a suit will come out and say people are saying they saw swamp gas and airplanes thinking they were seeing aliens. A lot of our money will be spent so a bunch of people can make fun of us or try to convince us 
we're seeing things. Uh, they'll probably call it Project Blue Book 2.0. If they were smart, well, if the government really wanted to have a reporting center, uh, they should just get Peter Davenport to run it. Uh, something like the National UFO Reporting Center, which has been doing the Air Force's job since 1969. The important thing is to send him the money, otherwise waste it on some government agency. I'll bet he would do a heck of a lot better job. January 2021, 6 a.m. in Great Falls, Manta Montana, a couple of witnesses were in bed about to get up when something caught their eyes outside the window. It looked like an airplane was coming straight at their house. As it got closer, the witnesses began to think this thing was going to crash into the side of their house. They jumped out of bed to get a better look at it. And now the thing looked more like a helicopter. There were two lights on the underside. One was white and the other was red. They looked as if they were revolving, but not in a consistent manner. It was a random movement, like the lights were scanning the ground, looking for something. The craft was within 50 feet of the window when it stopped moving, and it just hovered in the air. There was no sound. This close to the house, a helicopter would have been very loud, even a drone would have been audible. As the pair stood there watching the UFO, it suddenly shot straight up, vanishing from sight in seconds. That same month, several pilots flying in and out of Pakistan saw things they thought were UFOs. One was caught on video. The pilots saw a bright object in the sky. They contacted the control tower to report it. This object was about a thousand feet above their aircraft. As the men in the cockpit watched the object, they could make out a ring that went around the middle of this round craft. It kind of looked like Saturn. So yes, I'm sure the skeptics will say, oh, these two pilots were simply looking at the planet Saturn. They kept an eye on the UFO as they moved through the sky. It stayed in one place as the plane continued on to their destination. The airline came out with a statement that indeed they did get a report of things in the sky they couldn't explain, and there was an ongoing investigation. They never did find out what pilots had been seeing. In Fargo, North Dakota, a man was driving home from work at about 7 a.m. when a light in the sky caught his attention. He watched the light as he sat at a signal light. The thing looked so odd he pulled out his cell phone and he made a quick video of it. In the video, you can see this was not a single light, but a group of maybe 12 lights in a circle. Looking closely at the video, you can just make out a dark object in the middle. The lights appear to be around the edge of a huge saucer shape. The UFO hung in the sky, not moving. The witness had to get going, so he drove away, still trying to keep one eye on this weird flying craft. As some speculated that the craft may have just sat down or taken off from the ground near where it was spotted. It's great to theorize about what may have happened, but we really have no idea what the craft was doing or why. In February in Gulf Breeze, Florida, a witness saw a group of lights. These lights were in a line that stretched the horizon, blinking with no rhyme or reason. The witness had stepped outside for a few minutes and had just begun using their phone when they saw the lights. They were blinking on and off all along the lower section of the sky. 
The light display lasted about ten minutes before they all just simply stopped blinking. Uh, Carlos Arispe and his friend were driving along a mines road, also known as FM 1472. They were past what is known as the end of the pavement. Mines Road runs all the way to Eagle Pass, but FM 1472 becomes FM 1021. They were heading to Laredo and coming up on a big curve. There's a white cross on the left side denoting where somebody died in a vehicle accident. Uh, Carlos looked at the cross and said, What if someone pops out of the bushes? He was referring to a ghost of whoever had died there. They both looked at the cross as they went by. Then their attention was drawn upward to the sky. There were about twenty lights, about the height of a two electric poles, forming a circle. The lights were too bright and too big to be stars. As they watched these lights, they began to blink off and then back on, one at a time, moving along the circle. This aerial light display went on for a few minutes, and then the lights all blinked off. All they could say was, this was a weird-looking thing to see. Way back when I worked for a living... I was up Mines Road waiting for traffic when I saw a ring of bright lights to my north-northeast. They were far brighter than the stars around them, and they formed a circle about three inches across if I held my hand out at arm's length. They were at maybe 10,000 feet. I'm guessing the height based on how high planes are flying when they see them in the sky. These lights were blinking. Sometimes one would blink off and then on. Other times two or three would blink at the same time. I stood there on the side of the road watching them when an 18-wheeler stopped right next to me. The driver jumped out, pointing up at the sky, and said he'd been watching these lights for about a minute. He asked me what those things were. Well, I said I had no idea. We stood there and we watched the lights blink for a few seconds, and then he jumped back in the cab of his truck, turned to me and said, Don't tell anybody I saw those things. And then he drove away. I have no idea who this man was, and I wouldn't tell anybody who he was if I did know his name. The point is, I don't know why those lights were blinking or what it might have meant. As I meet folks and ask them if they've ever seen a UFO, uh, some have told me about seeing this same basic sight. A circle of lights with some blinking on and off. Not one or two witnesses, but maybe a dozen. Would an advanced race that could travel the universe use semaphores, a blinking lights, to communicate? As far as I know, the military don't use blinking lights either. This went out of use in the middle of World War II, as radios got better and easier to use. Trying to figure out why the UFOs were blinking is kind of like trying to figure out why Roswell, my cat, likes to poop on the floor near the cat box. I've asked her, but she doesn't say. We have no real understanding of what aliens from another planet might be doing or thinking. My theory, and this is one of those not recreatable things in a lab kind of things, maybe the UFO is blinking to attract attention to itself. Then, some unknown entity is waiting to see who reports it. I did contact MUFON, and I wrote out a report on what I'd seen. And now some government agency, as well as maybe the aliens, know I was watching the sky. Is this valuable information? And not all by itself. 
but a huge pile of reports all placed together might tell somebody something of importance. In February, Flight 2292 was flying over New Mexico when they spotted a cylindrical flying object. This UFO was at 36,000 feet and moving faster than anything the pilots had ever seen before. The air crew called the control tower and asked if there were any targets in the area around them. Once on the ground, a report was filed. The FBI got involved looking into what was buzzing past the aircraft. The odd thing is, there had been other reports of UFOs in this area in the past. The object reported in the past were described as also looking like huge cylinders. And now that the military are accepting reports of unknown objects, commercial pilots are beginning to come forward as well. Only time will tell if we ever find out what the government is hiding. A delving into reports of UFOs from the past, Sometimes you can find stories passed on from people involved. Many of the official reports are missing. This is either due to sloppy bookkeeping practices, lost or misplaced records, or some unknown and unnamed government office showed up and seized all the documents involved. In either October or November 1966, a strange occurrence took place late one night. <clears throat> On Farm to Market Road, or FM 490, approximately four miles from U.S. Highway 281, just north of Edinburgh, Texas, a motorist spotted eight men on the side of the road. These men were yelling and screaming for help. The motorist stopped to find out what was wrong. After talking to the men, he drove to a nearby truck stop in order to call the sheriff's department. The radio operator, George Rapp, working the night desk, took the call, and then he sent J.R. Milo Ponce, a deputy sheriff with the Dalgo County Sheriff's Department, to investigate the caller's story. The dispatcher stated that someone had called in to report a group of disturbed men standing alongside FM 490, north of Edinburgh, near Laguna Seca Road. When Deputy Ponce and his partner arrived at the scene of the disturbance, he found the eight men. The workers told the deputies of having seen bright lights, and hearing a loud humming or throbbing sound. They also experienced sudden strong winds on an otherwise calm night. They saw flames shoot down out of the sky, setting all the surrounding area on fire, including their vehicles and the mobile home they had been staying in. The Caliche pit workers were a crew of eight men from North Texas. All of them told the same story of that eerie night. The men were taken to the sheriff's office where they were interviewed and then allowed to spend the night. None of these men wanted to return to the Caliche pit even in order to recover their personal belongings. They swore to the sheriff's deputies that they would never return to the site of the incident. The story goes they all left town the following day, happy to escape with their lives. They had to take a bus, since all of their vehicles were now gone. A Joe Ponzi, the son of the deputy first sent to the scene, says that Sheriff E.E. E. Vickers had told his dad... He'd been approached by two men dressed in military uniforms who asked to see the report about the incident. Vickers, a resident of Donna, Texas, was the county sheriff from 1955 to 1969. Vickers thought the men might have come from Moore Air Base, 
which is located about 10 miles southwest of the site where the incident happened. Joe recounted the day after the incident. He was taken to the scene by his father. The entire area around where the caliche pit was being dug had been burned. There were several pickup trucks, an old trailer, and earth-moving equipment, all badly burned. Joe was 18 at the time. Noe Torres, a local UFO investigator, looked into the scene years later. There were still pieces of burnt metal laying around the field. Some of the rocks showed signs of having been scorched. The Sheriff's Department has no written report for the night of the attack. The uniformed men took everything pertaining to the case away to be buried in some government vault. This mysterious 1966 UFO incident helped encourage Edinburgh city officials to have no way develop the Edinburgh Out of This World UFO Festival and Conference. This get-together is held each year in April. It is the third best UFO conference in the world. Uh, not bad for a small town in Texas. Uh, Noe Torres, who's been on the show, is an author, publisher, UFO investigator, and MUFON member here in Texas. He holds a bachelor's in English and a master's in library science from the University of Texas in Austin. Along with UFO researcher Eubin, <laughs> Eubin, Ruben Uriarte, who has been on the show three times, Noe has authored a number of books relating to UFO phenomena and appeared frequently in media and at conferences. So far, the pair have written many acclaimed books. Mexico's Roswell, The Other Roswell, Aliens in the Forest and the, the Koyame Incident, The Real Cowboys and Aliens, UFO counter Encounters of the Old West, and Fallen Angel, which is the story about the Laredo Incident. What could have motivated an attack on a group of men working, digging a pit on the side of the road? Could they have accidentally disturbed some hidden item the beings from outer space wanted to keep secret? Or could this have been some secret government project set into motion with an unexpected outcome? Until the government releases records, we may never know. Edinburgh has held the UFO conference for many years now. There were four UFO conferences in the area at one time. There was Edinburgh, Laredo, Del Rio, and Presidio. The idea was to have one every couple of months so that folks could either attend all four or just the one closest to their homes. The folks in Edinburgh know how to make it a success. They start planning the April conference in April, right after the conference closes. They take maybe a week or two off and then begin working on the next year's events. The whole town gets involved. The festival is held at City Hall. Unfortunately, the other three cities kind of lost their drive, and we now only have the Edinburgh Conference still going. Moore Airfield was opened in September 20, 1941, as an Army Air Corps training facility. It was used by student pilots to learn how to operate single-engine airplanes. The field was named for a pilot, Second Lieutenant Frank Murchison Moore. Moore was a native of Houston who was killed on September 2, 1918, during the battles of Fismus and Fismet in World War I. 
The school was reorganized as the 2529th Army Air Force Base Unit, April 1, 1944. The school and air field were closed October 31, 1945. April Fool's Day and Halloween. Just a bit of a weird coincidence. In 1950, part of the field was operating as the Weaver H. Baker Memorial Sanitarium, used for tuberculosis patients, and part was jointly operated by Mission McAllen and Edinburgh is a tri-city municipal airport. The sanitarium was closed 1952 when the Air Force began using the base once more. Moore Air Force Base was closed for good July 1963. Part of the base was sold to private companies and the rest was transferred to the Department of Agriculture. Under the Department of Agriculture, the base was used as part of a program to eradicate the screwworm fly. In 1977, the scientists of the Screwworm Research Unit relocated from the laboratory at Moore Air Force Base to a facility near Texla Gutierrez, Chiapas, Mexico. The Department of Agriculture continues running the base, which is now a secure facility. There's a fence running completely around the place. The gates are all monitored by armed guards who also patrol the perimeter. When Noe Torres inquired as to how he might gain entrance to the facility, he was told he would have to talk to his congressman. And Noe asked, why was there so much security on an agricultural facility, to which he was told nothing. Over the past few years, more aircraft hangars have been built. A few people who work on the base have said from time to time they've been told to move to a secure building while some unknown aircraft was loading, usually late at night. To add to the mystery, the area surrounding the airbase has a long history of UFO sightings. In 2019, a woman was driving past the airbase when she spotted what looked like a huge, glowing flying disc right over the road ahead of her. The disc was about 30 feet above the surface of the road and it was big enough to reach both sides of the road at once. The witness could see the trees on the side of the road were being whipped back and forth by the energy coming from the bottom of this craft. As she drove a bit closer, the woman came to a roadblock being manned by local law enforcement. The officials wouldn't allow anyone to drive any closer to the flying disc. Once the disc was no longer in sight, the road was opened back up to the public. Uh, people who work on the base in the past have told about seeing Air Force planes landing and men coming off the planes in hazmat suits. On occasion, these men looked like they were wearing space suits. The Air Force personnel got busy scanning the ground of the base looking for something only they were privy to. Yikes, what the heck is that? Uh, to add to this, the government began doing radioactive abatement on parts of the grounds. Oh, that was just a giant truck driving down the street that I didn't know giant trucks were allowed on the street. It would seem there may have been nuclear or chemical devices stored on the base at one time. What is going on inside the fenced-in area being supposedly used by the Department of Agriculture for secret dealings is anyone's guess. The government refuses to tell us. In Catula, Texas, February 21, 2013, at around 8.30 or 9 p.m., a strange object was seen in the sky. Gracie Gonzalez, she was on the show years ago, 
was getting ready to take a drive. She got in her car and was about to leave when she noticed something flying overhead. It appeared to be about 16 feet long, and it looked rectangular from the angle she could see it. The object was hovering about twice the height of a telephone pole from the ground. <clears throat> As she watched this unknown object pass overhead, it suddenly emitted a bright white light, illuminating the area around the car. The light didn't seem to give off any heat and she didn't feel any kind of electrical or other physical effects from being in the light. The light came on twice, a short flashing pulse, and then it stopped. Not knowing what this strange flying object might be, Gracie called her brother to come have a look. Her brother Frank came out of their home to see if he could figure out what was flying around over their town. The object had moved away, so they got in the car and they drove around the neighborhood for about 30 minutes trying to spot this weird thing once more. As they were driving, they could see others from the neighborhood looking up into the sky. They all appeared to have seen the object as well, but nobody had any idea of what they had seen. Gracie made an entry in her diary so she was able to remember all the details in the future while telling her story. Later that same week, her niece said, Oh yes, my teacher said she saw something too. The unknown flying object hasn't come back as far as Gracie or Frank know, but there was never an explanation as to what people had seen. Over the years, people have seen all manner of flying objects that are not explained as aircraft, clouds, or weather balloons. On several occasions, people have seen bright orange orbs. Fifteen oil field workers saw an orange orb that split into several smaller orbs near Catula. Uh, the smaller orbs chased each other around the sky until two jet fighters arrived, at which point the orbs sped away. On another occasion, the witness spotted a cluster of bright lights, all much larger than any of the stars around them. One bright light was blinking while the others simply hung there. There was no sound coming from the lights, and they faded away after a few seconds. It seems as if Catula is a hot spot for UFO sightings. A UFO was spotted in the air north of San Ignacio. The unknown craft was first seen as a set of lights that changed from one color to another. It hung in the sky for several hours. People who saw these weird lights would go inside their homes to wake relatives so they could come out and see these lights as well. The three days after the sighting, a man's body was found on a ranch approximately below where the lights had been seen. The man had been a worker on one of the ranches. He was found laying on the ground with a rifle beside him. The rifle had been fired several times and the spent shell cases were all around him on the ground. At the autopsy, it was determined the man had died from fright. What did this unfortunate man see? It is believed he saw the lights overhead and began shooting at them. Something happened immediately after causing him to die. Something so terrifying, his heart stopped beating. In Hebronville, Texas, Joshua Flores' family owns two ranches which were inherited by his wife. One is called Los San Juanes Ranch. One night, after a small barbecue, Joshua and his father-in-law were drinking some beers outside. He had his one million candle power flashlight, and sitting with his wife and father-in-law, he would aim it at the sky and just to see if there was anybody out there. 
he blinked the light at the sky for a few minutes. Suddenly, three beams of light came straight down from nowhere, uh, coming to rest at their feet. His father-in-law was so frightened by these lights from outer space that he ran for the door to the house. Uh, Joshua stood there with his wife, wondering if they were about to be abducted. After a few minutes of nothing happening, the lights went out. And no one involved found any side effects after being lit up by these beams. In Far, Texas, in 2014, Gilbert Garcia was driving his Dodge Magnum on Christmas night at about 9.30 p.m. He was just out for a drive, enjoying the quiet of the mostly deserted roads. The sky was slightly overcast, but visibility was good. As he was heading east on Business 83, he noticed a bright light in the sky. It looked like a street light, only it was much bigger and brighter than any of the lights along the highway. The light looked as if it were hovering over the lumber yard. Wondering what he was looking at, Gilbert took a left, trying to get a better view. As he was getting close enough to see what this light might be, he got his cell phone ready to take a photo. As the details were coming into focus, the light suddenly shot straight up into the clouds overhead, fading from view. He was left wondering what had just vanished into the night. In 2017, Gilbert was northbound on US-84, about 20 miles outside of Schneider, Texas. He, it was either January or February. Gilbert was in the passenger seat of his co-worker was driving, heading to a job site. There were just the two of them in the first pickup, followed by a second pickup with five other fellow workers. The two vehicles were en route to Amarillo. The sky was slightly overcast. At around 7.15 a.m., Gilbert spotted a light over the road. It looked to be about 10 miles ahead. At first, he thought it was a helicopter or maybe some other aircraft looking for something along the road. Maybe the sheriff's department or DPS were looking for speeders. Gilbert asked the driver if he was watching the light. The driver said yes, he'd been keeping an eye on it for the last few minutes. They continued north, getting closer to the light. As their truck was passing right under it, Gilbert leaned forward up against the windshield to try to get a better look. Once again... The light shot straight up into the clouds. Gilbert couldn't help but think this was exactly like the last time. The driver asked what had happened to the light, and Gilbert filled him in on how the light had vanished. Next, he called the other pickup to ask if they'd seen the light. The driver of the other truck said he hadn't seen anything, and everybody else in the pickup was asleep. The mystery light had been in view for about 15 to 20 minutes. Here is a story from Laredo, Texas. When Lisa was about 15, she lived on a ranch outside of Laredo. It was one of those places where they had to walk a long dirt road out to the bus stop to get to school. Her and her friend Melina were walking to the stop early one morning. As they got close to the gate, they spotted three or four bright lights up in the sky. At first, the two young girls thought they were just looking at some stars, but they were moving. They watched as the stars danced around overhead, suddenly moving together, forming one big bright star-like light. The light took off, flying away far faster than any airplane could have moved. They gave each other a look and asked if the other had seen the same thing. This was not the kind of thing they wanted to discuss with others, 
so they kept deciding to themselves. Years later, when Lisa was 17 or 18 years old, she realized there was a period of time missing from her memory. She had come to to find she was someplace with no idea where she was or how she got there. It became obvious when she attended a party. As several of the kids attending came over and began talking to her as if they were long-time friends. She racked her brain, trying to put names to these people, but still felt as if they were total strangers. These kids called her by name and continued as if she should know them. As the one-sided conversation went on, they said Lisa had lived with them for a few weeks. As she began to suspect these kids were playing some kind of an elaborate joke at her expense. The mother and grandmother of these kids walked over and each hugged Lisa, saying they had missed her and were glad to see her again, hoping all was well. These statements made Lisa remember the time she had felt as if she were lost somewhere and now couldn't remember the family around her. She told them she didn't remember them at all. This led to more confusion as the family talked about how nice it had been to have Lisa as a guest in their house. They told her she had been very nice and they enjoyed their time together. They told her it was, much, it was most definitely her because she had a very distinguishable birthmark under her chin and they had noticed it. Lisa listened to them, growing more concerned about her missing time. Even with the stories about her visit, Lisa never found the memories hidden away somewhere in her mind. The entire family wished her all the best, and they parted ways for what appeared to have been the second time. From that time on, Lisa has found several times in her memory where hours or days are missing. Times she can't remember how she wound up in a place or what had transpired during her trip to get there. She believes the lost periods of missing time is from 2019. Today, Lisa will get a feeling she needs to step outside. Once there, she scans the sky and sure enough, she'll spot a UFO. She feels as if it's calling to her to come out and communicate with the occupants of these unknown craft. This happens all the time, both night and day. A mines road northwest of Laredo, Servando runs a tire recycling operation just off of mines road. On many nights, right after sundown, he, as well as his workers, have seen weird lights in the sky. It begins with one bright stationary light in the sky northwest. A second light appears in the sky a little ways from the first light, and the first light will slowly fade from sight. This is followed by a third light, as the second light will fade. This may happen several times before the lights are all out. People driving along Mines Road have seen odd lights in the sky on many occasions. This can't be airplanes because the light isn't moving or blinking. It just hangs there in the night sky and then slowly fades away. The lights are almost all following the same line, but once in a while a light will appear below or above the others. Someone was even able to catch the lights in a video and put it on the internet. While driving along 255 en route to San Antonio, Servando spotted more odd lights. He was with his wife and they both looked at the lights blinking on and off as if in some kind of a pattern. They turned on to I-35 and they could still see the lights to their left. As they were drawing near the Border Patrol checkpoint, the lights vanished from sight. 
On the return trip back to Laredo, once more the lights were there, somewhere over Webb County or maybe Mexico. A man named Vince has also seen these strange lights just north of 255. Texas, northeast from Edinburgh, is a small farming town of Lyford. Estelle Oaks lived in a trailer home on her family's farm. As she was sitting on the couch watching TV, when a bright light lit up the curtains. As she went to the door to see if someone was driving up with their high beams on. As she looked out the door towards the barn, where she saw a huge oval-shaped flying craft. There were lights all along its edges. Estelle could hear a deep humming sound coming from the craft. The saucer was almost sitting on the ground on the other side of the barn. She ran to contact her father and get him to come see the flying saucer that was on their property. The craft vanished before she could get him. From that day on, she talked about this occurrence any time the subject of UFOs came up, doing her best to mimic the sounds that it made. Years later, Estelle's son, George Oaks, was running the farm. The tractor driver told him there was a strange-looking circle on the ground. George went to see for himself. There was a huge circle on the ground where the dirt looked as if it had been dried and powdered. The dirt looked soft, and he wanted to see if it was as it seemed. There was a wrench in the tractor, so he grabbed it and poked at the ground. The wrench sank into the dirt as if it were hardly there. When the wrench sank as far as his hand, he went and grabbed an 18-foot piece of PVC pipe. The pipe sank as if the dirt were hardly there at all. It passed through 18 feet of dirt with hardly any resistance. Nobody wanted to plow over it, so instead they would plow within a few feet, leaving the circle in place. The strange circle was visible for years before it finally faded away. Now, this circle brings to mind a UFO sighting from Delphos, Kansas. A low rumbling sound was first heard, followed by an intense display of bright multicolored lights. The lights were coming from a mushroom-shaped object that was slowly moving over the field, several feet above the ground. The boy who witnessed this flying craft said it was visible for about five minutes. When he arrived home, his parents said he'd been gone for 30 minutes. The family followed him to where he'd seen the flying craft. There was a ring of dirt that looked churned up. His mother touched the dirt and her hand went numb. She quickly brushed the dirt off her hand and her leg went numb as well. This numbness lasted for several days. And nobody had contact with the dirt in the circle in Layford. The only contact was using the wrench and the piece of plastic pipe, and as far as anyone knows, there was no evidence of anything happening to these two objects. In Concepcion, Texas, on July, uh, June 30, 2021, between 9 and 9.45 p.m., George Oaks II was out checking his feeders and hunting coyotes along with his six-year-old son, George Oaks III. George III asked, What's the big white, big white light? The light was low on the horizon and not moving. It looked as if it were about five or six miles away. The Kingsville Naval Air Station was just seven miles to the northeast. A Navy aircraft flew over the ranch all the time, and George II was familiar with just about everything they had. The white light stayed in sight for about 15 minutes before it vanished. Soon after the white light was gone, 
three lights appeared in a triangular formation. These lights were closer, about a half a mile away. The lights were three different colors, green, blue, and orange. A George II called his wife and showed her what they were looking at using his cell phone. She took several screenshots of the lights before they all took off in different directions. The orange light was the closest one to them, so George began chasing the light in his pickup. They managed to stay with it for about five to eight minutes, driving at 15 miles an hour. They followed it until their pursuit ended at a fence line. George did question whether or not the light had been, he'd seen could have been something inside the vehicle reflecting in the windshield. There was nothing in the cab or around them that would give off any of the colors they'd seen. The bright white light he had first appeared on the horizon didn't move along with the stars around it. When his wife enlarged the images on her computer, the orange light was shaped like a trapezoid. Having followed UFO stories in the news, George II knew many sightings were over or near military bases. Perhaps the UFO they'd seen was keeping an eye on the Navy. The location of his grandmother's sighting was five miles from where the two Georges saw theirs. A Copper Hill, Virginia John and Rachel live in an old house near the Blue Ridge Parkway. Late one evening, they were outside to do some stargazing and trying to see the International Space Station pass overhead. It would look like a huge bright star that would slowly move from west to east as the Earth rotated. John was scanning the sky trying to spot the man-made satellite. After a while, figuring they might be looking in the wrong part of the sky, he had to bring his chin down to give the muscles in his neck a break. As his gaze came level with the yard, he saw some kind of a big circular blob thing. He said it reminded him of how the T-1000 robot had looked in Terminator 2. The silvery mass it would become when changing shape. This thing was right next to the tree in their front yard. That thump was Roswell jumping onto my desk. And not wanting to alarm Rachel, John kept this sighting to himself. Uh, just maybe it was an illusion brought on by staring up too long. As soon as his neck recovered, John looked back up trying to see the ISS. Rachel suddenly grabbed his arm. She told him she had seen something in the yard, only what she saw was closer to them. This thing was now halfway between the tree and the house. Rachel described her sighting as being a huge, shimmering blob that kind of made her think of the yin and yang symbol. It looked to be made from liquid metal, and it was moving in a swirling pattern. Rachel let out a scream of shock. She told John the thing had just zoomed right over their heads, passing within a few feet of them. The thing had been going very fast. Not knowing what be, might be flying around in the yard, John and Rachel moved inside. They kept looking out the windows, trying to see if whatever it had been had gone away or was still out there. Uh, talking back and forth, they decided it didn't feel dangerous. There had been no malevolent activity. It made them nervous because they'd never seen anything like it before, nor had they ever heard of anybody encountering a swirling mass flying around like that. They have decided to watch for the thing to return and try to steady it and maybe communicate with it should the opportunity come up. They also plan to take precautions, such as keeping their kids away if they see it and saging their home afterwards. Rachel thought the thing might have been something like a drone with a cloaking device, 
It felt extraterrestrial, as if it were flying over their heads, as she thought the thing was reflecting light from an upstairs window, giving it the golden color. Contacting people who study things like this, John was told it could have been a portal opening in the yard, or maybe some kind of a scout ship from an unknown world. It didn't seem to be a living creature, but it might have been controlled by some being. Whatever it was, it hasn't come back yet. A Saturday evening, November 6th, at about 8 p.m., my wife and I went out to dinner at Danny's on Jockaman Road. We'd been there for about 15 or 20 minutes when we both heard what sounded like a Black Hawk helicopter flying right over the building. It was loud and we could feel the vibrations of something flying too close to the building. The table between us shook and the glasses of tea that we had, you could see the ripples. The airport is about a half a mile from where we were, and I just figured the military were flying north and the pilot had gotten a bit too close. None of the people around us seemed to notice, so we went on with our meal. About two hours later, I received a message from the Laredo Paranormal Research Society saying a woman had seen a flying saucer right over Jockaman Road at about 8.20. It had scared her, and she wanted to know what she had seen and what might happen. This was around the same time that we had heard and felt the weird sound. Julio and Marta live in a condo just south of Saunders Street. November 11, 2021, they got home from work and they were walking out to the mailbox when they spotted what looked like birds flying towards them. As the objects got closer, they both heard a buzzing sound. Then, Julio noticed the birds were actually flying discs of some kind. Him and Marta stood there watching as seven weird-looking discs flew over their heads in formation. There was one craft leading the others, followed by two more out on either side, Four craft were coming up last, forming a triangle. These flying craft were coming from the north, heading south. They would have passed just to the west of the airport. When shown a photograph taken a week earlier of what looks like a flying saucer taken near Jockaman Road, Julio said it looked like the craft they had seen. It's two and a half miles from Julio and Marta's condo to Jockaman Road. As some of these stories have never been told before, I interviewed the witnesses. Others I got from the internet or from people I know. In some cases, the term unknown flying object isn't correct. The witness or witnesses knew what they were looking at. It was a flying saucer. The big nothing we had back in June was all we can expect from the folks in Washington. Uh, politicians will promise people anything and everything to get elected. Then, they have a hard time remembering their campaign promises. If you enjoyed the show, let others know what they're missing. If you'd like to contact me, send an email to strangethings at arcanasa.com. If you're listening on one of the many platforms out there, and you decide you'd like to hear all of my shows, you can find all the past shows, all 290 I think, on iHeartRadio or on Spreaker.com. The Spreaker is some kind of a... I, it's a word from another country. I don't know what it means. I've tried looking it up, but I can't find it. But if you want to hear all the archives, go to either Spreaker, iHeartRadio, or you can find them on YouTube. But if you go to YouTube, be sure and type in the whole name. Strange Things with Chris James. 
because the last time I checked, there were 38 podcasts using strange things as part of the name. Till next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree.